Hi, I'm Brian Watrous of VMware Education. In this video, we're going to explore a technique used in orchestrator workflows known as wrapping workflows. This video is one in a series of videos in which we're exploring vCenter Orchestrator. In the preceding video, we took a look at how to create actions. In this particular video, we're going to turn our attention to a different technique in which we wrap one workflow within another workflow. Wrapping workflows involves invoking one workflow from within another. In other words, there's an inner workflow and an outer workflow. Additionally, wrapping workflows involves making strategic decisions about whether to bind the inner workflow's inputs as input parameters or as attributes. Wrapping a workflow allows you to do a lot of different things, but in particular, with, when we wrap workflows, we're able to limit what the user that's calling your workflow is able to do. If he was able to call the inner workflow directly, then that might provide more control over how the workflow behaves than you want to give the user. So we wrap the workflow. Additionally, wrapping a workflow allows us to hide the complexity of the inner workflow. So if you have a workflow, or perhaps somebody else has created a workflow, but it's too complex for your users, you can wrap that complex workflow within your workflow to simplify the user experience. And additionally, wrapping a workflow allows us to build enhanced functionality around the inner workflow. So if you have a workflow that doesn't quite provide the capabilities that you need, you can wrap that workflow with your workflow, enhance it, and make it do exactly what you need it to do. In this demonstration, I'll show you how to use wrapping to wrap one workflow within another. One of the great things about Orchestrator is its building block approach to development. Uh, for instance, if I want to create a new virtual machine, I suppose I could create a workflow from scratch, but VMware already provides workflows to do tasks such as that. For instance, if we go into the workflow library and look under vCenter, under virtual machine management, basic, you'll notice that there already are several different workflows that can be used to create virtual machines. I'm going to use one called create simple virtual machine. So that's going to be the inner workflow. I'm going to wrap it with my workflow. To do so, I'll begin by creating my workflow. So I'll right click, choose new workflow, and I'll call my workflow, the outer workflow, wrapped workflow. Again, as always, I should set the version number and type a description to save a little time here in this video. I'll skip that particular step. Instead, what I'm going to do is go straight to the schema tab. Now, if you recall from the previous video, we showed you how you could hook up an action within your workflow by dragging and dropping an action element, hooking it up, and away you go. The same thing works with workflows. If I drag a workflow schema element onto the schema, the first thing that I'm asked is to specify the name of the workflow that I want to call. So I want to call that workflow I showed you a few moments ago called Create Simple Virtual Machine. Now if I wanted to, I could just let my user call that workflow directly, but if you look at this workflow more closely, let's look at its visual binding tab. Notice that that workflow has quite a few inputs. When, when this workflow is called, whoever's calling it can specify what they want the new virtual machine to be called, what guest OS um, we're going to install into the virtual machine, and so forth. But this gives the caller of the workflow perhaps a lot more control than you're willing to let the caller have. So what we can do by wrapping this workflow is make some strategic decisions about exactly which of these input parameters we want to expose to whoever's calling our workflow. So for instance, we might want to allow the caller of our workflow to specify the name of the virtual machine that it's going to get created. So we'll simply drag and drop to create an input parameter. Again, remember, since this is an input parameter, the user calling our workflow is going to be asked to supply the VM name. But all these other parameters, if I don't want the user to have control over them or I don't want to confuse the user with them, for all these others, I can simply create attributes. Now, 
I can, in the act of setting up the attributes, I can actually set their values right here and right now. Uh, to illustrate that, I'll do that with this one variable. So I'm gonna click, not set, and if I hit enter here, you can see that this is a list of the uh, guest operating system that vCenter knows about. So for instance, if we're gonna install, uh, let's see, uh, Windows 2000 server, we could, or how about advanced server, we could simply specify that operating system and do so in the act of uh, hooking up the parameter itself. But to illustrate that you can do this different ways, this next parameter, which specifies where the user's VM is going to be placed in the vCenter inventory, uh, we'll again set that up as an attribute, but I don't have to set the value right now. In fact, I'm not going to set the value right now. I'm not going to set it for this parameter or any of these other parameters. Instead, I'm just going to go with defaults for right now, and we'll, we'll set their values as necessary in a few moments. Now, as you see, I've used the visual binding tab to set up the bindings from my workflow to the inner workflow that we're calling. Uh, we cut out a portion of that video because it's a bit time consuming to drag and drop between these two sections. Uh, that's the idea behind this setup button that I have skipped earlier. If you click on the setup button, you can say things such as, oh, make all of, make all of the inner workflows inputs attributes in my workflow. So the setup button can be a considerable time saver. But having set up these different connections, uh, we saw that we can set the value of the attributes as we do so, or we can do so later. To show you how that works, uh, please notice that these were all attributes that I set up. I'm going to close the schema editor and go over to the general tab because after all that's where attributes are created. These are the attributes that were automatically created a few moments ago in the visual binding tab and you'll notice that for one of them I set the value of the attribute as I did the binding but for these others I didn't uh, set their initial value but I can do so here now, for instance, for thin provisioning, I can say, yes, I want the virtual disk to be thin provisioned. Notice I, the developer, am in, in, in control now. It's not the user who's saying whether or not to thin provision. I'm saying whether or not they should thin provision. Now, I can do the same thing with the data store. If I don't want the user to be able to control exactly which data store his virtual machine is created in, I'll just set up that particular input as an attribute. That way, I can specify exactly which data store I want him in. And I can do the same thing for, and will do uh, the same thing for all these other parameters. We'll cut that portion of the video out, though, to speed things up. And as you can see, I've now gone through each and every one of these attributes and set their values as I see fit. So as the developer, we can set up, um, in effect, uh, these attributes so that they're in line with whatever the corporate or organizational policies are. So for instance, our virtual machines, if a user runs this workflow, the virtual machine is gonna be created in, excuse me, it will run on host ESXi01, and it'll be plugged into a network called VM network. So when you want control over various inputs, when you call an inner workflow, you set up the inner workflow's inputs as attributes. And anything that you want exposed to the user, you simply set up as input parameters. Now there's a little bit more work we need to do to hook up this workflow schema element because in addition to the inputs, this schema element also has a single output. And the output in this case is a virtual machine object that holds the new virtual machine that was created. Now if I want the, the user who's calling my workflow to have a, uh, to be able to get a hold of that virtual machine object, I could create this as an output parameter, or again, this, uh, with wrapping, I get to decide whether I want to expose this as an output parameter, or perhaps I just want to create it as an attribute. If I create this output, param this output as an attribute, then the user's not going to ever see it. But having set this up, again, I'll validate my workflow is valid. I'll save and close my workflow. 
And now when I run the workflow, the key thing to notice here is instead of being asked the 10 or so different input parameters that the inner workflow exposes, our workflow that we just created, the one that wraps that more complicated workflow, simply asks the user one simple question. It just asks the user, what's the name of the virtual machine you want to create? So the user comes in and types my VM, clicks submit, my workflow, calls the inner workflow, and when that inner workflow is done, my workflow is done, and if we were to go look in the vSphere client, you would see I now have a new virtual machine called my VM. This concludes this demonstration in which we showed you how to wrap workflows. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to check out the other videos in the series to learn more about vCenter Orchestrator. For in-depth, hands-on orchestrator training, enroll in the VMware vCenter Orchestrator Develop Workflows class and connect with other orchestrator developers online at communities.vmware.com. Thank you.